its own oxygen supply, but not as a gas, as a liquid. If you cool oxygen gas down to a very low temperature, it turns into a liquid. In this form, oxygen really does help the way things burn, as we discovered with the help of a chemist in a university laboratory. You've probably seen how a cigarette burns in air, but let's see how it burns after it's soaked up liquid oxygen. This biscuit's also soaking up liquid oxygen. But don't worry about getting your biscuits too close to the fire. Biscuits don't burn very well in air because there's not a lot of oxygen there. Neither does this cotton wool. You can hardly even see the flames. But when you've been soaking another piece of cotton wool in liquid oxygen, you've got to be a bit more careful. But liquid oxygen isn't just found in a laboratory. However, in the rocket engines which are used at present, aniline is not uh, used as the fuel. Instead, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine was used as the fuel in Apollo spacecraft, along with N2O4 as the oxidizer. And we can now demonstrate the burning of that particular fuel combination. It's necessary for us, first of all, therefore, to load the fuel tank. The hydrazine is the fuel, and here we have 30 millilitres of the fuel, which we'll now put into this tank. And you can rest assured that the actual loading procedure used by the Apollo technicians is rather more sophisticated than the one which I'm using here. However, there we have the fuel component now loaded. And we must now proceed to load the oxidant, the N2O4. It has been necessary to pre-cool the tank here because the N2O4 is very volatile. And as you, as you will see, it will create a fairly large amount of fuming. It is also a rather toxic compound, which it is inadvisable to breathe. Now we have both tanks loaded and are ready to fire. They're both soft metals. This is lithium. And this is sodium. And they both react with water. First lithium. Then sodium. and they too should react with water in the same way. That 
that was rubidium. Let's see that again. And now cesium. All the metals in this group react in a similar way with water. Mind you, the reactions aren't exactly the same. Remember how lithium at the top of the column reacted with water. But potassium, from the middle of the group, reacted more vigorously. And then there was cesium from near the bottom. These changes in reactivity go... There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and osmium, and acetine, and radium, and gold, protactinium, and indium, and gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, bromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercury, molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum, plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, krypton, neon, radon, xenon, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard, and there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. Uh,